Hey, what's up, guys, and welcome to episode 42 more. It's a lot of them of Talk For, the quickfire podcast where we ask four great questions to unique and interesting people. Behind the mic today is your host, Louis Scoopian. That's me. And our special, very, very, very special guest for today, Tony O'Dell, who's going to be answering some questions today. So, Tony, please say hi, introduce yourself, and give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do before I shoot some questions. Well, first of all, hello to you, Louis. Hello, hello sir. to all of your listeners. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So, well, what I do and what I've been up to uh, these past forty-four years of my life is um, I've been act. I'm an actor, professional actor. I started professionally acting in 1978. Um, so I have been acting for forty-four years and done everything from stage to TV, to film, TV series, movies. And the last 25 of my years, I have been also coaching fellow actors um, for auditions for TV and film and actually on set as well for Disney Channel the past 13 years and um, for tons of different projects and movies. And um, yeah, it's been an exciting career, both in front and behind the camera. Hell yeah. And guys, yeah, this this is a super, super interesting guest that we've got on today. And I've been looking into, you know, Tony's past and he's done so many amazing things. And it's just a plethora of questions to ask. And it's a shame we're limited to only four, but we're going to get as much out as we can. Now, I just want to say before we crack on with it, there's a few funny things that have happened recently. And this is one of them. We we got in touch for the first time only just last night on Halloween. And this guy was an OG Cobra Kai. And I reached out to start with. I've been watching the Karate Kid and Cobra Kai recently. Big fan. And he's been in he's been in it from the beginning. And the other funny thing as well, not just the Halloween side of it, but I actually bought a bonsai tree on Friday, way before I'd, I'd started talking to Tony. And it just arrived today on the day of the podcast. So it just so happens we actually have a bit of a Miyagi Do versus Cobra Kai thing kind of going on here. I've got my little bonsai tree up there and we've got the Cobra Kai guy in the podcast That's right now. It's funny so. that you would actually receive a bonsai tree. I mean, you right there, that is the Miyagi blessing. <laughs> it is amazing. It's just all lined up so perfectly well. So Honestly, it's hilarious, but hey. Maybe Tony... you should head out and play the lottery, Louie. <laughs> you know what? I, It's not a bad call. I probably should. I mean, it's all just coincided so well. And the other thing as well is, that blows my mind, Tony is a massive fan of tennis as well. And he's he's met all these amazing people. He's played doubles with, I mean, you can tell the story, Tony, of course, but you're heavily involved in tennis as well. And when I was reaching out, I mentioned I was a tennis player. And that's actually why why we've, we've, we got talking good and proper, isn't it? So why don't you I say mean, I do get that? a lot of requests mm. to do, you know, podcasts and do interviews. Um, but what was funny and what caught my eye was the fact that you said that, you know, you played uh, tennis on a professional level. And um, I have a lot of respect for tennis players. I feel there's a lot of... Um, there's there's a lot of uh, similarity between the two in terms of in terms of singles at least of course mm-hmm. you're just out there on your own and you are competing and for me as an actor you're going in there f- on on an audition and you're not really competing with anyone else you're competing with yourself you're either going to go in there you're going to have a great day or you're going to go in there and you're going to get all in your head and you're going to not stay free enough to do what you want to do, which I hear a lot of tennis players say, I got in my head, you start overthinking things, and then you're not just going along with your natural talent. But, but you know, I, I fell in love with tennis because I knew that when I was growing up professionally as an actor, there were a lot of pro-am tournaments where celebrities would be paired up with professional tennis players and we'd get a chance to play for various causes and, and you know, uh, certain things like that. And so the next thing I know, and I pulled them off the wall just to show you, the next thing I know is, you know, I was prepared to play doubles with, you know, Bjorn Borg. There it is. Know, got to play with him and against him and then play doubles with Rod Laver and Roy Emerson. And uh, then, of course, when uh became friends with Martina when she won her ninth Wimbledon 
she sent me this saying, Tony, thanks for believing, which was pretty awesome. I actually did go to the U.S. Open and and got to sit in her player's box and watch her play a, a, a couple of times. And um, so that was great. So, yeah, I've had a lot of uh, love for tennis, playing tennis, and I think there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, no, there definitely is. And we had a good call last night as well. And we spoke a, few, a bit about some of the things that are similar between acting and tennis. And there really is a lot of stuff that's that's very similar and the, the challenges as well. And no, I'm just honoured to to have you here today, Tony. And I, I feel like the, the planets have kind of aligned a bit for this one. And um, I've got four great questions lined up for you. So if you're ready to crack on, shall we get on with question number one? Hit it. Awesome. Right. So for question one, tell me about your backstory. I always like to ask this first. Um, how did you originally get into acting? How did you land the role for the Karate Kid? And where has your career taken you since then? OK, so, well, I was a teenager and I told my uh, mom at the age of 16 that I wanted to become a professional actor. And of course, she said, no, you're crazy. We don't know anybody in the business. You don't know anything about it. And so I said I would pay um uh, my way into a local acting class. And she said, if you want to do that, go ahead. I did that. Then I got involved with a local theater. And um, around the time I was 18, I asked someone for a list of agents. And um, one of the dads at the theater said, oh, I have a, a list of Hollywood agents. So I sent in my picture and resume to an agent that I knew was a top Hollywood agent for kids. And I sent it in and she called me and she started sending me out just to see how well I do. And on my fifth audition, I booked the job. It was a small film, but I got my SAG card, which is kind of like, that's our union, Screen Actors Guild. So I immediately within three months, five months, something like that, got my Screen Actors Guild card. And then I got my other union card, which was my after card. And then... Um, various guest spots and certain roles. And then that was 78. And then in 1983, which was five years later, I had the opportunity to audition for Karate Kid. And uh, just, you know, she called me up, said, hey, you have this audition for this new film called The Karate Kid. It's with John Avildsen, who was the director of, um, of Rocky. He'll be the director. And it's starring Ralph Macchio and Pat Morita. And I'd only known Pat Morita as, as um, his, from his character from Happy Days, mm. which was a sitcom that he was very well known for. And uh, that's all I knew. So I went in an audition for Karate Kid. John Avildsen saw me. Um, he said, we were only going to have four Cobra Kais, but I really, really liked you. And I want to add you. And you're going to be the fifth. And you're only going to have a couple of lines, but you're going to be there the whole time. And you are going to be a Cobra Kai. So that's how that all started. And then that just kind of led to so many other things. And uh, of course, with the success of Karate Kid, I was then able to carry that into, you know, the many audition rooms that I that I went in. And, you know, that's the first thing they would say is, you're a Cobra Kai. Mm. And I'd be, yes, I am. And, you know, that gave us something to talk about. And then I ended up doing other series as well. I did head of the class for five years. Um, and uh, that was very successful series on ABC. Um, probably had about 33, 34 million viewers uh, from the time of 1986 to 1991. And then that just led to so many other things. Um, you're right though. I mean, I, I was obviously not born at that point then. I was, I was born in 2002. But I'm very aware that Karate Kid... And just kid, to be clear, I did yeah. freeze in time. I did freeze myself in time, so... <laughs> okay, okay. But, yeah, no, I can imagine after something like that with how well it went, that is a very heavy card to lay on the table, isn't it? That is a that is the ace of spades, in a sense. And, um, and recently, obviously, Cobra Kai, the series, has done amazingly. And I have to say, I, I've... I've I did have a binge watch and it's exceptionally good. I really, really enjoyed it. And I loved seeing your, your episodes as well. And it made me wonder how, you know, what was it like after all these years getting the call back for that? And what was the whole experience like, you know, meeting back up with all the guys and being in that experience again? I mean, tell me a bit about that. It was, it was great. Um, 
I mean, I knew that they were doing it. Uh, I think that Billy and Ralph had been approached um, over the years about doing a show like this. And I don't think that it was, it was just ever the right uh, story and ever the right situation. And they, um, they weren't into it. And then these three guys came along and, uh, and they are incredible producers, writers. Um, they were all great friends in law school and decided to leave law school and become writers and follow their dream. And they did Hot Tub Time Machine, which is how they originally met Billy because Billy was in Hot Tub Time Machine. And then they, I guess, originally approached Billy with this idea. And then Billy talked to Ralph and they got Ralph's interest and then they went around pitching it. And, you know, of course it ended up the first season on YouTube red. And then uh, after the first season was moved over to Netflix, um, which I was very happy about because season two, which, which I was in uh, you know, that was its first year on Netflix. And that's what really, I think really then of course made it blow up um, was, was making that move. And I don't necessarily know how or why that happened. I'm just glad that it did. And how I originally found out about myself uh, being a part of it was I was coaching on a series um, uh, for Disney Channel and I got a phone call and uh, they said that the executive producers wanted to speak with me. And they called me up and said, hey, we want you to come back. We're going to do a very special episode about the five OGs coming back. Of course, we only got four, but um, they said, you know, we're going to handle this well. We're going to give you plenty to do. Jimmy's going to have a big voice and um, and you're going to have a blast. And it was, it was a blast being back with the guys again. And um, it was extremely surreal to look at each other after 36, 37 years and be playing the same characters. And we all look somewhat the same mm. and here we are again and it was like we really hadn't really left the set i mean yeah it's just it's just eye candy and just feel good nostalgia for all the fans out there the whole thing and you're so right i don't know the writers i know there was three of them like you said but they've done such an amazing job of it because it's not just it's not just the cinematography or having the actors or something there's so many smartly inlaid bits of references to the past of the karate kid and there's so many little things that you to someone who's only just gone into cobra kai that you obviously they wouldn't know it but so many things that you could just miss out on and just not quite notice and then going over it a second time you think oh my god they actually did that and they've just packed it out with so much smart stuff they've moved it all into the future but they've kept all the stuff from the past as well and it's just it's a great mix of everything and it just it's it's just a great watch and yeah but well, what i love yeah. about it is the fact that you know it really is just been kind of like they took karate kid and just it's really just an extension and has that same exact feel and vibe that karate kid had so I thought that they, that Josh, John and Hayden were so incredibly smart just to basically take all of the things that I feel, all of the reasons as to why the audience loved Karate Kid. Mm -hmm. What were those reasons? Why did the audience love the movie so much? Why did they connect to it the way they did? Why did they, the audience, when we saw it in Westwood, when it screened for the first time, why did they jump on their seats and cheer? you know, at the end. And I think they wanted to take those, those reasons and bring them into Cobra Kai, just adding a second generation, but making it feel the same with the music and everything. And um, that's exactly what they did. Mm, couldn't scream more. And well, I mean, you've, you've had a hell of an acting career and excuse the cheese, but you did kick ass. It's been a kick ass acting career, and you've done more of that afterwards as well. You 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 went to coach people. You coached actors, some big big names. And so, for my second question, leading on from that first one, 
you've worked with and coached some of the biggest movie stars out there right now, like Zendaya, who's obviously been hyper successful. And my question is, in the people that you have worked with in the past, have you noticed anything that you feel is an indicator of how far they're going to go? And the ones that did go very far, what do you think set them apart? And is it possible to spot star quality at a young age? Um, I think it is. It is possible to uh, spot star quality um, or just someone that you know has it, has the na- the raw natural talent, um, just as you would spot a tennis player and just say watching that person play, they just have raw talent. They just, just the way they hit the ball is just so natural for them. Mm. Um, and you can spot that in in a kid or someone you know someone who walks in the door you can immediately spot if they have natural ability or it's or is it something that they are become good at but it's something because they have to really really work at it and really learning really learn the craft of you know whether it's dramatic acting or sitcom acting because they're two different styles um it's like singles and doubles they're two different games yeah um and but the difference in terms of, you know, I, I feel like if someone has natural ability, they might be an actor who just works their whole life. They work, you know who they are, you kind of recognize them, they're somewhat known, but they never like explode to that stratosphere kind of stardom, someone like a Zendaya. And I feel like that comes few and far between. And, and, and maybe what it is, is, I mean, let's face it. She's, um, she's a beautiful woman. She is five foot 10, five foot 10 and a half. You know, she walks in a room and, and she's just, you know, she's beautiful. She's got long legs. You know, she has, uh, gotten very known in the fashion world. And she has marketed herself in a way and her team has marketed her in a way that the only place she really had to go was up. Mm -hmm. But she had all of it. She had the height. She had the looks. She has the talent. And, you know, not just an actress, but a singer, a dancer, She really has had it all. And then her team had the ability to market her and put her up for the types of projects that would just take her all the way. Mm -hmm. You know, be it Greatest Showman, then Spider-Man, then Dune, now Euphoria. They have just been a very calculated um, moves you know, very much like a, a chess game, you know, and that's really how you have how you have to treat it when you know that you are getting those opportunities and people are looking at you and you're getting all those opportunities, then it's up to you to carefully decide, you know, what 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 road you're going to take. Mm, I think I think what you just said there, actually, that's universal as well. That's life advice. And I'm interested then I, uh, I looked through the Instagram and I saw obviously the pictures you had with her and it, she was very young at, at, at the start when you obviously first met her and stuff. So it's been a, it's been a yeah, long time. 13. 13. So I'm interested when, when she, when you met each other for the first time and you obviously you coached her, did you know that it was going to, that she had something really special? Was it obvious to you or was it? Well, something it's interesting that was developed? because Disney channel had sent me the pilot and they said, you know, we're interested in having you coach on this series it was um, my first time coaching with Disney Channel, although I started coaching on set in 97. And um, I watched the pilot and I went in and I spoke with them and they said, so what did you think? And I said, it's really good. I really liked the girls. And I said, I really liked this girl Zendaya. I said, uh, she's very natural. Hmm. And they said, yeah, we thought so too. And and, um, and, you know, I didn't necessarily quite know at the time that she was going to become the person she did. 
I was kind of along with her along the ride, you know, along the way. So, you know, I was coaching her on the series. Then I saw that she got the opportunity to do Dancing with the Stars, which is a huge show here. Um, and she placed second. And then I knew that she was starting to get certain opportunities. Um, you know, she screen tested for X-Men and uh, I coached her for that and she didn't get it. And then she had the opportunity to audition and screen test for Spider-Man. And we just decided, hey, you're going to go in there and you're just going to kill this and you're just going to nail it and you're just going to leave it all on the floor which is what I feel every tennis player needs to do when they go out there. You just can't, you just got to go out there and just leave it all on the floor. And she did. And she booked that trilogy. Um, and she did the same with Dune. She booked that trilogy and, uh, and euphoria. And um, it's just pretty, it's been amazing to really, to witness it, but it's not something that everybody gets to do, you know, not everybody gets to do that, have that opportunity. And there's a lot of talented people out there, but to get to that level, there has to be something about you. And like I said, she kind of encompassed everything with the looks, the height, the talent, fashion, music. I mean, she just, she had everything to throw up against the wall. Mm, that's, it's an amazing thing what she's done. I, I truly think that, and obviously you coaching her, that's an amazing thing too, but I totally agree. And I think for people in any walk of life, tennis, acting, whatever it may be, absolutely. If you have something, if you've got attributes or you've got a talent or you've got something about you that you know is just a little bit special, it's just a bit out of the ordinary, that's the motto goes. You've got to strike first and you've got to strike hard and you've got to chase it down. And, and that's what people say. But people squander these opportunities so much and they they hesitate and they think, they think on it for too long and they they end up finding all the reasons why not to do it. And that just pollutes the original the original thoughts and the hope that they actually have something really special because most of the time people do. And you just got to go out and do it. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Yeah, you can get in your head about a million things, but you just have to literally say, OK, you know, do I want this? Bottom, bottom line, do I want this? Then you have to stay focused on that and just live and breathe it. Mm. Like Everything you, you do has to be, and you know, yeah, you're going to have the distractions with your friends and they want to come you to come out and they want you to party. And I mean, that happened to me a lot when I was auditioning and when I was working as an actor, I was living in an apartment building. My, my friends were all living next door in the next apartment it was like almost like our own frat house we weren't at college we were all in hollywood we were all actors and that was our fraternity you know but it was like hey come on out with us and you know party with us tonight and i'm like mm, no um i have a big audition tomorrow morning so i gotta stay home i gotta work on these lines and i just want to go in and i want to kill it tomorrow and, it and i just kind of just stayed on the straight and narrow and and um you know when you want something you you have to go otherwise you're just spinning your wheels and what's the point of putting all your your energy into it mm. when you're only doing it half-assed so true and it, it's hard to say no isn't it it's very it's very difficult to say no not just it's just so tough because people nowadays there's so many there's so many yes people out there and it's very difficult to say no to a friend when they want you to go out because it's it is a good time it's fun and yeah well of course yeah. especially when you're young you know mm. when you're young you want to go out with your friends and party and have fun who doesn't but you know if you're really serious about your dream and that is really what you want i think it comes down to having a serious conversation with yourself Mm. and saying is this really what i want well then if it is then sorry guys but i'm you know love you guys but i'm not letting anything get in the way of my dream so powerful so doesn't mean powerful. you're not important to me but my dream is more important 
Absolutely. And, and um, you know, and uh, and it and it pays off because, like I said, when you go on that audition, it's just you in there, mm. and the work that you put into it. And they're like, "Yeah, but what's it going to hurt if you have a beer or two? I'm like, "But what if I go in and I don't necessarily do give a hundred percent? What if I only gave eighty seven percent? There's always going to be that question in my mind: Was it because?" I did go and have that beer or two. So maybe I'm not quite exactly as sharp as I could have been. Mm, I don't have time point. for that. Well, otherwise I'm spinning my wheels, you know? Yeah, there is, there's a large allure of, of these times and just saying, okay, fine, fuck it. I'm going to do it. And yeah, absolutely. 100% true. And Actually, that is funny because you do have to go all in. And that's actually what happened with this podcast. I'm talking to you right now on episode 42 of this thing. And I never had any experience of it before. In fact, I just made a story uh, before my first episode and I tagged a few people actually recommending their content and for people to follow them. And one of them came back and thanked me. And I just sent him the message and I asked him thinking about starting this podcast. And it turns out he had 400,000 followers at the time and... He, I don't think he knew it was my first episode, but I, I made it sound like it. I, I had this podcast going and he said yes to it. And I just went in and I did it. And since then, it's just been one episode to the next, one episode to the next. And it's been the same with tennis. I left school to go homeschooled for the tennis when I got sponsored. And it's all just been, OK, I've got this talent. I've got this opportunity and I'm going to take it. And anyway, so moving on from from that as well. So when you're someone who wants to get into the industry, actually, this goes perfectly from what we were just talking about. So for my third question, for people who want to get into acting, for example, or are just starting out in that journey, do you have any tips for beginners on how to quickly improve and get noticed and land their first role? And on the flip side of that, are there any mistakes or trap doors to avoid? Well, it's a kind of maybe like a little bit of a two-part question. Um, first of all, I tell anybody, because they may not be living in the city, in the type of city that is going to give them those opportunities to audition for, uh, you know, getting an, or getting just getting an agent. Um, you know, if you're living in some small town, and I'm not saying that because people in Hollywood who were famous once came from those small towns, but what they would have to do is from a very early age, I would think is get involved in school plays, do school plays. If there's a local theater, get involved in the local theater, um, just start getting your experience and do as much you know, get as much experience as you can doing acting and, you know, building your resume. I did this play. I did this play. Be able to stick those things on your resume. Now, granted, I feel that then once you are in a place where you can um, meet someone who can further your career, career being an agent, you'd have to be more like in a city where they have theatrical agents who can then submit you for projects that will give you your first break. So, you know, then you have to get to a city where you have that opportunity, whether it's in New York or in LA or Chicago or, um, you know, New Orleans or Atlanta, where, where there's a lot of industry now. Um, so you have to then, if you're in a city where all you've been able to do is get experience in high school or in local theater, then they have to eventually work their way to a city where they can um, hopefully meet with an agent who will represent them and give them these opportunities. And that's why I do meet so many parents. You know, the mother will come here with the kid to leave the father behind with, an, with you know, another kid or just... It's just them and they come out and they because they they know they have to be here in order to get with an agent in order to pursue this. So um, it's really about them getting to a place where they can, you know, meet an agent who can give them this opportunity. 
I think that's um that's an excellent point. Absolutely. And it just got me thinking, actually, that people we do get lucky, don't we? Occasionally an opportunity comes, something can happen, you can meet someone anywhere. I mean, I've I've met really amazing people just on the train before and got chatting with them and things do happen, but you have to put yourself in the position where you can get lucky or or that opportunity can happen because you know you can't get lucky if if there's a zero percent chance of of it happening but if there's a two percent chance of it happening and you've put yourself in a place where where that opportunity could just happen even if it's extremely unlikely then that's it, it, that's the same for every, everything isn't it too it's the same for yeah, tennis like i said i mean you oh. might be in you know in in Boise, Idaho. Now, obviously, no, this is not a commentary on Boise, Idaho. The, the comment is the fact that I don't know how much of the entertainment industry is, is in Boise. So you might be someone who grows up there, does high school, you know, does plays, does local theater in Boise. I'm sure they have a local theater house where they people do plays, but I don't know how much of the industry is there. So mm-hmm. then they're going to have to look for places where they have these theater camps, or seminars that are outside of there where they're going to have to fly there and, and take place in acting seminars and uh, places where maybe agents and managers go to those things to scout new talent. Um, Not everybody can get on the bus or get on the plane and come to LA. I mean, Brad Pitt did, you know, and um, he worked at El Pollo Loco for, a while, but it wasn't long before people like really looked at him. He was somebody who had the the it factor. He was a uh, you know young, good looking kid. He was uh, an actor, and he you know got started getting represented by the right people, and they gave him all of the opportunity that he needed. But he already had the that that it factor that was then able to just skyrocket. Mm. Um, but yeah, so sometimes you are in a place where your 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 opportunity is only going to take you so far, and then you have to figure out a way to expose yourself further. Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you're not known, then no one no one can give you an opportunity at all. You know, and, and not to yeah. keep making comparisons to tennis, but you might be somebody who just plays locally in your little city and be really really good where you are. But then you have to eventually start getting out, figuring out a way to get to those other tournaments and those other cities when, you know, and earning your points and traveling and doing all those things so you can expose yourself more. And, you know, so you, true. You, you got to get out there. Absolutely. And that really just goes back to what we were just saying in the last question as well at the end there. You've got to be all in. And, and that does take a sacrifice as well, whether that's financially or moving away or getting to somewhere where you can find that opportunity. And and I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna copy you. I'm gonna make the tennis reference as well. It's true. If you live somewhere that's very remote and you've been playing there for for years, you just sometimes you just can't grow anymore from there. You need new players. You need a better academy. You need a new coach who's more experienced and. And it does take a sacrifice and you've got to be all in. But that's that's where most people fail. I mean, I, I hate to imagine some of the opportunities and people who could have made it big time if they had just taken the chance and gone for their dream rather than sticking to the safety or just not going for not going for the, for the dream, really. And it, it, it's a sad thing to to think about. But people need to know about it, don't they? Yeah. And, and, you know, and then there's the other aspect of it too. And, you know, and sometimes people may not have the financial ability to be able to get to those other places to have those experiences and gain more talent and more, you know, um, but I just say, Hey, there've been plenty of people who have come from you know, that have come from nothing. And yeah, maybe it was difficult for them, but they, their talent spoke for itself. And that alone was able to, you know, make it easier for them to, to get to those places and, and then shine, uh, shine in the way they needed to when, when people were watching. Hell yeah. So true, honestly. And it's just, like I said, it's just a shame that people don't don't do it. 
uh, then people just squander the opportunities they get and they they leave talent behind and that that uh, I've had a lot of entrepreneurs and success people stories on on the podcast and that there is this trend and these people had to sacrifice something and usually that's safety mostly financial safety and they would have started the the typical story is I was in my nine to five job just wasn't happy but I was making just about enough income I had this idea and I just left the job and I went and did it no one believed me everyone thought I was crazy and then it clicked and then it worked out and that seems to be the story for everyone and you do have to be all in and it's scary and you need support from people a lot of the time but <laughs> there's nothing worse than than regret is there in this world and if you if you always are left with the question of what if I had what if I had done this what if I had gone to this place or taken that chance where could I be today there's nothing worse than it to be honest and I'm sure you've had to do that a lot as well and even even at the beginning of your story when you were saying you were 16 and mum wasn't sure what you were doing, didn't really believe in you, but you knew it. And I'm sure she probably wanted you just to stick to school or go to college or whatever it was back in the day. I mean, you can tell the story, of course, but you would have taken a chance in it. You would have taken a sacrifice and look, look how it's paid off. Imagine if you hadn't, you wouldn't be sitting here today if, if, if you hadn't, that's for yeah, sure. I mean, they both weren't really, they weren't for it, you know? And so I went and did you know, went and did plays at a local theater and they came to see him and they're like, okay, well, that's great. And then I was like, oh, by the way, I sent picture into this, you know, agent, picture and resume in this agent. And she brought me in and she signed me. Oh, she did? Oh, well, that's great. You're going to go to college. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go to college, you know. And I was going to go to Pasadena City College. And then I started it. And then they were like, um, you know, and I was like, oh, by the way, though, I got to take a few weeks off from college because I just got a part in the film. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, great. So when you're done with that, you're going to come back and you're going to go to college. Yeah. Okay, great. And then I came back and went to college for like a week or two. And then I got a guest spot in a TV series. And I was like, I got to take another two weeks off because I got a guest spot in the TV series. Okay. But you're going to go back. Yeah. I, would. I finished that. Went back to college for a week or two, booked another, you know, and it just got to the point where I was like, Hey, um, this acting thing is kind of taking off full time. And, you know, I was 18 and 19 years old and I was already making like $40,000 in my career. So, you know, in, in, as an 18 or 19 year old, that's I'm good. pretty outstanding. Especially back and then as well. The point, and then I booked a series and then I was like, well, now I can't go because I have this opportunity to do this series and it's going to be worth 150 grand or whatever, you know, and it's like you getting the opportunity to go on the play on the pro tour and you're doing well, you're clicking and you're doing well. Mm -hmm. So it's like, sorry, but maybe college is something I'll think about later. But right now, the, you know, the pan is hot. Hell yeah. And so I struck. Yes, he did. Because the pan <laughs> was hot. I didn't know it was going to be strike first, strike hard. I found that out a few years later, but <laughs> well, I you mean, know, from now on, you're going to probably have to wear the Cobra on your tennis outfits <laughs> or like on one of your tennis hats. You're just going to have to have a Cobra. I love that. Right. I would do that as well. That That is absolutely the kind of thing I would do. And I would use a philosophy. I'd be like, OK, strike first. That forehand is going line before yours is absolutely that seven volley. It's coming. You're not getting a chance to hit another ball in this rally. And that's assuming you get that return back in the court. Yeah, I, I could I could definitely uh I could definitely accommodate a little bit of Cobra Kai in the uh, in in the old ten tennis style, that's for sure. It, it's amazing because when I went to go watch the, the women play play recently in San Diego, I watched a couple of matches where you could just see a player having that mental attitude of I'm not even going to let this other player even find their game. Can imagine. Just immediately came out there because some come out there and you can see they're feeling it out and just trying to see, you know, how it's kind of going, but they weren't dictating. And then the, there's the other player who comes out and from the, from she's leaning into every shot and she's dictating every shot, you know, and I'm like, okay, the other player isn't even getting a chance to even find their rhythm because this player is just made the decision 
I'm just going for it. Now, granted, I know, you know, you can have those thoughts and you step on the court. I'm going to dictate every point. And then for some reason, you're just hitting that much wide on every single one. Mm, yeah. And you have to sometimes have to rethink, but um, I know you don't want to talk tennis. <laughs> I do. I'm enjoying this. This, this is good talk. And, I and I'm, I'm sure from doing these interviews, you've learned a lot yourself just about I tell you what, going back to episode one or two or three and listening back on it, compared to how it sounds now, I I I I can't I can't lie. I, there's there's cringe. It, it's cringy. I, I I don't I don't like to listen to it because I feel oh why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why does this sound so robotic? And it's just got so much better. And and it's true, you know, practice makes perfect. And the more you do, the, the more you get into it, the more the flow comes out. And mm -hmm. the tennis references are so true. And I, I, lo I love the idea about the Cobra on, on the tennis kit. That's 100% going to happen. And um, yeah, it's just like yeah. you have to be like right here or like right on the back of your hat. Just something there, you know. <laughs> it's true, though, isn't um, it? Tennis is just one of those things you you can just have such a good day everything is working and then you can also have one of those days where it's just absolutely garbage but what you were what we were saying about being aggressive striking first on court and dictating totally agreed with that and you got to think about tennis a lot of the time from a from a percentage perspective what percentage of this shot the forehand line am i going to make and i'm, I'm going to hit well i don't know Eight, eighty percent, ninety percent, something like that, and that's all positive. If you keep hitting that shot, you're going to win because the, the odds are so stacked in your favor, and it's going to work out eventually. But if you're passive and you let other people dictate, I will always back someone who's being more aggressive. I mean, obviously, good players, not club standard or something, but I'll always back someone who's being aggressive and aggressive and taking the shots because tennis players are very well worked people they've hit millions of shots they've done this for years especially at a high level and someone who's being aggressive and stepping up and taking the game to them they're very dangerous very dangerous players and couldn't agree more with that point absolutely yeah. so yeah go on no i was just i was <laughs> agreeing with everything with uh <laughs> with with everything you're saying i mean of course it always helps to know the abilities of the uh other players you're playing against um obviously when you're a high ranked player you can have people go and scout those players if you haven't met them somewhere along the way and haven't played them and don't know their game um i find it it's probably very interesting when you are earlier in your career and you have to step on the court with other players and you don't know their game, you don't know who they are. And you've got to figure that out real quick. You know, what's their forehand, mm. what's their backhand, what, what is their, what is their arsenal? Hell yeah. Um, I, I would do the same with actors too, though. Hey, what, what's, what are these other actors about these other actors that are auditioning for the same role, you know? So true. And what am I going to have to do? Absolutely. And for, there's for a, just there's casting. only one difference. There's only one difference between us. If you step out there and you are by far the better player, chances are you're going to win that match. But as an actor, it's very different because I can go in the room and maybe have given the very best audition that they that the producers and the director saw. Mm -hmm. but if I don't fit the role and the look of the role, there's nothing I can do about it. They have a preconceived notion as to who that character is and what that character looks like. So the bottom line is if I'm going up for the role of Thor and I go in there and I just do a killer audition, but Brad Pitt walks behind me <laughs> and he walks in the room, maybe he does an audition that's just as good. Maybe he does not, but based on how he looks, they're going to give him the role. And I can't tell you how many times I went in on audition and they said to my agent, he gave the best audition we saw that day. 
He gave the best audition we saw, but he's not 5'11 with brown eyes. <laughs> that must be And my, my whole thought was, well, then why did you put me up for it to begin with if you knew? And it was always because we want to get you in front of the casting people. We want to get you up in front of them just to hear those very words. He gave the very best audition we saw that day. And that's what I tell my actors now. Don't, when you go in there, don't worry about booking the job. Book the room. That's Win them so over. Good. Win them good. over. Book the room because every casting office you go into, if you go in there and you win the room and you book the room, then that casting director is going to call you in for every opportunity they can. Mm -hmm. And eventually you are going to book with that casting director and you're going to book with that casting director and you're going to book with that one because you went in there originally and you booked the room. You can't possibly worry about booking that job because there's too many variables that that get in the way. Hence, not being 5'10 and with brown eyes. So all you can do is just go in there and do the very best job you can. It's all you can do. Yeah, that's that's superb advice. And I just find this so funny, just picturing this though. You've just nailed your audition you're feeling great and you just loving life and then there he is the door opens with his long wavy hair and 50 pack six pack <laughs> there he is and the heart sinks <laughs> i can imagine that that that's a very gutting feeling but but th oh there's definitely well, a funny that side never, to it that never happened uh, in that respect, or with Brad, um, Brad actually guest starred on Head of the Class, which was the series I was starring in, and he guest starred on on Head of the Class. So, so we, you know, we worked together back then. But I will say that in 1991, I went and lived in New York, and I got the opportunity to audition for one of the soaps. I think it was All My Children at the time. My agent said, "Hey, you got an audition? You know." going to go here and audition for this big soap opera. Now, I know soap opera actors. I know what they look like. Mm. And it's not that I thought that I was, uh, you know, um, that I was slim pickings. You know, I thought I had a, a good look going in. I knew I could definitely deliver. And I remember there wasn't anybody in the waiting room and uh, I went in and I auditioned. And by the time I came out, there were about three guys sitting there who were all about 6'1", six, 6'2". Six, and each one of them looked like a Ken doll. Like, you know, Barbie and Ken. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they all looked like they had all stepped off the cover of GQ. And I just remember thinking to myself, oh, fuck. I was like, what am I even doing here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine the you six know, foot. And in those moments, helped. I just knew. Okay, that was the one. I can. I, I, I can that, yeah, like I booked the room, and that's all I could do because I knew there was no chance. And that's just something I tell all my actors: you can't think about that, and you can't worry about that because at the end of the day, you have no control over that. It's not mm -hmm. like you can go home and you can, you know, add an, a foot a foot more to your height and. You, there's only so much you can do it's true you can only control the controllables but anyway so to talk a little bit more about the roles that you you have done um for the fourth and final question really nice way to round this off um out of this very long and incredibly impressive career you've had doing many things many many things uh what are you most proud of and was there a particular moment or time or an event that you felt was the absolute pinnacle of your work Ooh, that's a, that's a tough one to answer um I can you know and, and to say like the moment that i was most proud of there have been so many along the way i mean obviously the success of karate kid um the success of head of the class um you know head of the class was a top rated series for five years on abc 
I started in 114 episodes. Um, it was, it was, it was huge. Um, being able to buy a home at the age of 27 and it's a home that I'm still in, <laughs> you know, um, I've been in this home for, uh, 36 years, something like that. Um, there really hasn't been one thing. There's been so many great prizes along the way. Um, seeing the success of my students, seeing the success of Zendaya when she won the Emmy last year. And then this year she won the Emmy again, and she's the youngest person ever to, to win an Emmy. Um, so there's been so many, there really have been so many uh, just amazing moments along the way. And, um, you know, I think it's just great for me to, I just basically count my blessings every day and just really grateful for the opportunities that I've had. And um, I'm really grateful that I still get to keep having those opportunities maybe be back for season six for Cobra Kai. Um, who knows? Maybe um, other opportunities or roles might come my way where um, I might get back in front of the camera on something else or see the success of another student. Uh, it's just, it's still exciting to be able to still be doing this 45 years later. That a tennis player can't say. A tennis player can't say I'm still on the AT. I'm still on the tour. Forty. I guess maybe they can if they were uh, playing what they call the seniors, the seniors tournament. Indeed. Um, yeah, which they, I guess they could. So maybe I just answered my own question. But um, it's still exciting to to uh, to be a part of it this long. Brilliant. So good to see. I'm just going to say it. That was just a really long way of just saying I've got too much cool stuff to choose from, wasn't it? Let's be honest here. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we all. Hey, we, those are your words, rules. not mine. But um, <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, it's just so, so hard to find one one particular thing um i do remember one night driving home after filming an episode for head of the class and it was a show where i had a lot to do a lot to do it was paragraph after paragraph and it was just um it was just so much and it was one of those things where i just wasn't sure how i was going to get through it because it was so much to do and I was carrying every scene and um, it was a lot, you know, it's like you going mm. in for your finals match, you know, True. and it's just big and you play those tapes the night before and you play those tapes and you have all the self doubt because we're human and you don't always necessarily take your best advice. And driving home after being successful that night and coming out and doing that show in front of the audience and then driving home with a smile on my face from ear to ear because I knew that I had stepped into the fire and I had succeeded. Um, those are things that I definitely remember and I take with me. That is a beautiful thing. That's a great story. And you guys, just listen to this man. I mean, he's had such a great career acting, teaching actors, tennis, everything. He's done a fantastic job. And it's a shame to say it, but that is our four questions done for today. And before we wrap this up, it is time for what I like to call the shameless plug. So, Tony, feel free to take a minute and promote anything that you're working on. You want people to take a look at or just something that you believe in. Well, um, currently I'm coaching on two separate series 
One is called The Secrets of Sulphur Springs. I uh, just got finished shooting the third season in New Orleans. Um, Secrets of Sulphur Springs is on Disney Channel and on Disney Plus. And um, it's a really exciting, fun series, mystery. Um, and in fact, this morning, it just got nominated for Outstanding Show for um, the Children's and Family Emmys. So um, that's really exciting. And I'm very proud to be a part of that series. And then there's another series. It's a sitcom on Disney Channel and Disney Plus also called The Villains of Valley View. And it's a really funny concept. It's a family of super villains all trying to blend into a normal neighborhood. <laughs> so I get to coach on that as well. Um, so one's a drama mystery and one is a sitcom. So I'm challenged in two different ways. And uh, I enjoy coaching on both of those series. And then I got my own projects and things going on that, um, you know, little things in the works. Who knows? I might write a book. Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's just really about me just enjoying what I do and, and uh, you know, approaching every day with a smile. That's great stuff, Tony. Just going to say, if there is a book coming, I really hope there is. The fingers toes legs arms eyes they're all crossed and i want i want my name on one of those books so make sure you've got one ready to ship out to the uk because because I'm, I'm coming for you baby um but hey tony thank you so much for joining me today for the talk for podcast it has been an absolute pleasure having you on and a true honor it's been a pleasure louis it's a lot of fun brilliant Great questions, by the way thank you i'm i'm really glad you had a great time that means that means the world to me too and fingers are also crossed everything's crossed for another season of cobra kai let's hope it happens and i want to see you on there but hey guys yeah, thank you all for listening this has been episode 42 we are really pushing the 50 now it's it's looking good and uh, if you'd like to listen in to our past episodes Go and have a look at our channel. And if you'd like to listen in for our future ones, make sure to hit that subscribe button and spread some love by leaving a like and a comment. Signing off for now.